Hey guys. Hello. <laughs> we are, this is uh, one of the, well this is a episode on poetry. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about some criteria of poetry and share some poetry with you. And there'll be a part two to this. Um, we decided that the stuff that we had already put together was just too long and we needed to break it up a little. So part two, which will show up before too long uh, in your feed, is gonna be a lot, a lot, a lot of different resources, books, poets, things like that. But today we're gonna talk just about the criteria for poetry and give you some examples along the way. And good heavens, how could we do anything on poetry without a poem. Yeah, so we're going to read several poems to you probably. Yeah, we are. We're going to start with Mummy Slept Late and Daddy Fixed Breakfast by John Chiardi. You may not know John Chiardi, you may not know this poem, in which case, yay, you're going to learn them both uh, today. But this was the poem voted as kids' favorites in two separate pieces of research, which we'll talk about, uh, about kids and research. And so here it is. Daddy fixed breakfast, he made us each a waffle. It looked like gravel pudding. It tasted something awful. Ha ha, he said, I'll try again. This time I'll get it right. But what I got was in between bituminous and anthracite. A little too well done? Oh well, I'll have to start all over. That time what landed on my plate looked like a manhole cover. I tried, it with, I tried to cut it with a fork. The fork gave off a spark. I tried a knife and twisted it into a question mark. I tried it with a hacksaw. I tried it with a torch. It didn't even make a dent. It didn't even scorch. The next time Dad gets breakfast when Mommy's sleeping late, I think I'll skip the waffles. I'd sooner eat the plate. Um, I have read that poem so many she times has it by memory, that you I see. pretty much have it by memory, although I did pull up, just in case, I did pull up a copy of it. Uh, it's Mommy Slept Late and Daddy Fixed Breakfast by John Chiardi, and it's in a wonderful collection you'll see in the next video called You Read to Me and I'll Read to You, poems that we're supposed to kind of share back and forth with kids. So when we look at poetry, we're looking at, first and foremost, uh, I, I remember this as long as I live from the lecture that Dick Abrahamson gave in class, the most neglected genre, well, genre, it's not a genre, form, mm -hmm. format that's out there. And it's because many of us have had really bad experiences with poetry Or don't school. feel comfortable with poetry at all. Mm -hmm. Don't know, really know how to read it, uh, don't know if afraid to evaluate it and you know is it a good poem and it's a bad poem and then as Terry said we've had it drummed into us and it was a bad experience meaning you pick them apart and you make kids dread talking about what do the poems mean you know and so it's not always about that sometimes it's just about reading a poem for the enjoyment I still remember uh, my good friend Bob Sini talking about poetry and saying every time somebody says poetry, he smells formaldehyde because it reminds him of dissecting the fetal pig in school. You took it apart and apart and apart and apart and you were left with a big stinky pile of stuff uh, that you could never put back together in the same way. And I think sometimes we fear poetry because of that or as Karen also reminded us because who are we to read poetry? Right. When you hear a true poet read a poem, you just kind of sit there thinking, okay, I'll never read poetry again, right. that's fine. But you know what? We don't care. Um, we've yeah. been doing poetry with kids for so long uh, that we are totally comfortable doing it. We may not be the best poetry readers in the world, but who cares? You know, and poetry is one of the best things I like to have students write as well, mm -hmm. because it's the one thing where you can tell kids there really aren't any rules. You can make your poem be anything you want it to be because it's a it's that type of format mm -hmm. to where there are so many different types of poems that you know including free verse which you know yep. kids we well, you'll see in just a minute dislike it however it does give them the freedom to say when you don't it. have to follow a certain format I think there's a difference between the kind of poetry right. kids would opt to write and the kinds that they opt to read exactly too. Uh, I want to start with uh, a research study. It was done originally in 1974 by Ann Terry. Um, I know Ann, I took courses from her at one point. One summer I took writing courses from her. Uh, it was replicated by Karen Cutiper, who was my ELA coordinator in A-Leaf 20 years later. <laughs> she knows everybody. So I have personal connections to this research. And it's time to replicate it again, quite frankly. It's almost been... Um, 
well, it's been 25 years mm -hmm. or so since it's been done. So we probably need to take a look at this again and see if it still holds true. But I, I tend to think it probably does. They had basically five conclusions as they looked at what kind of poetry works well with kids, what do kids like. And by the way, this research was done with kids. Uh, they gave them a whole bunch of different kinds of poems, they shared them with them, and then they asked kids to basically evaluate them. And from there, they kind of went through and made, drew some conclusions. So um, let's share some of that research with you. Okay, so the first thing that kind of came out were that kids prefer narrative poetry. And when you think about it, I think that that almost comes away, um, or, or it makes sense because kids are used to getting a story. And so having that type of narrative feel into a poem se will seem very natural for them. Yeah, they, they just love poems that tell stories. Mm -hmm. And when you look at things that are really popular with kids, uh, she, well, Mommy Slept Late and Daddy Fixed Breakfast. Right. There's a narrative poem for you right there. But you look at Shel Silverstein, Jack oh, Perlutsky. Right. Sarah Cynthia Sylvia Stout would not take the garbage out. That's She's totally a story. She scoured the pots and the pans, candy the yams, and spiced the hams. I know. There you go. I can do that, too. I can also do sick. I cannot go to school today, said little Peggy Ann McKay. It's really sad that I no, remember these not things, sad. but not my own phone number sometimes. We but don't call ourselves. That's true. I, I have to give myself a break. So kids love narrative poem, mm -hmm. poetry. The two types of poetry they disliked were free verse and haiku. And I think that the exception here is when it comes to writing, because I think writing haiku is a whole lot easier than listening to it, than reading it you know, because it's so short and it's supposed to be kind of ephemeral. And free verse doesn't rhyme. And the first thing it, kids say is, how can um, it be a poem that right. doesn't rhyme? That's right. And that takes a while to break through. So the younger the reader, probably the more emphasis on rhythm and rhyme uh, that they like. And this particular uh, piece of research was elementary students. Uh, I think it would be really interesting to do one on secondary. I have a feeling that I know how it would turn out. Um, into the valley of death, you know, march, you know, and I think that I shall never see a poem, lovely as a tree, uh, all those awful things uh, that we had to um, not only teach but memorize in schools. And so that then, since they, they're disliking free verse, mm -hmm. be, we say because it has the lack of the feel of poem, of what they consider to be a poem, that leads into the next thing that they did discover, which was rhyme and rhythm and sound devices were strong preferences. Yeah. So that would be like alliteration, would be a, you know other sound devices, onomatopoeia, those kind of things, they like Absolutely. those type of things in, in the poems. Um, I always remember uh, the poem that Dick read when he was talking about this was um, by David McCord and it's called The Pickety Fence. And it's a kid walking down the street with a stick on a picket fence. Now, there are going to be a lot of kids we'll have to explain oh, that yeah. image to. But it was give it a lick. It's a clickety fence. Give it a lick. Give it a lick. Give it a lick with a lickety stick. Pickety, pickety, pickety pick. See, again, recite it often enough to have memorized it. It's that sound. Mm -hmm. It's the, uh, the kind of feelings that kind of emerge from And that's there. why tongue twisters are kind oh, of considered yeah. in, 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 you know, I don't know if that would be considered really a poem, but, you know, I always kind of did tongue twisters when we talked mm -hmm. about poetry. But there again, that's that sound device, yeah. you know, of the, the alliteration and, and just, it's, it, that's what they like. Yeah. The play with language. Absolutely. You know, the playing with the language. Um, so, funny poems were popular, mm -hmm. uh, along with poems about familiar experiences and animals. Uh, I find that, you know, that's kind of three very different disjointed type, yeah. kind of things. They love funny poems. That's why Mummy Slept Late and Daddy Fixed Breakfast works. I think it explains the continuing popularity of Shel Silverstein, Jack Prolutsky, right. uh, Judith Viorst, some of those folks who... Uh, X.J. Kennedy, J. Pat Lewis, uh, some of those hysterical poets, and we'll be talking about some of them in the mm -hmm. next broadcast uh, and giving you some specifics. But they love things about familiar experiences instead of, I think that I shall never see a poem right. lovely as a tree. And the, There's a poem yeah. called Every Time I Climb a Tree, and that's a much more familiar experience than standing going, isn't that a beautiful tree? Um, and then animal poems. With elementary students, mm -hmm. of course, you know, in the nonfiction section of your library, the animal collection of your of your library is always destroyed every day because they love animal books, nonfiction, and fiction. So it leads the, it, it it stands to reason they would also love that in poetry. And one of the uh, best selling books a couple years ago was the National Geographic book of poetry about animals. 
in just stunning photographs from the National Geographic Society with poetry that was collected and put together by J. Pat Lewis, if I remember correctly. There's a recent book um, that came out. It's a small book, and it's a uh, poems written from the perspective of a dog. And there's another mm -hmm. one, cat too. But I think the dog one was like, I I will pee on that or something, <laughs> you know. And so it's it's you know they they still are mm -hmm. are being published and not just for children. That's right. Oh. Um, there is a preference for contemporary poems and you know so there again I think that that would go along with the fact that that is more familiar yep. um, the language used is there again something that they would recognize rather than words that might be a little bit dated and, and that they would not feel as comfortable with I, Think that that. And when you look at the older poems, most of those were written for older right. readers. Yeah. Robert Frost, I don't think, ever envisioned an eighth grader reading Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening and contemplating the meaning of life. Uh, I just don't. And uh, I don't think Emily Dickinson hid poems so that kids couldn't find them. Uh, <laughs> you know, so contemporary poems. And, and by the way, that's relative because right. we've talked already about Shel Silverstein, Jack Perlutsky, Judith Viorst. These were folks who began writing poetry for kids in the 60s and 70s. Right. And so most of the kids that we're teaching today weren't alive yet. Right. And they view that as history. Oh, what a surprise. Uh, some additional criteria. And when uh, we do part two of this presentation, we'll have um, slides mm -hmm. that will give you links to all of this information that we're providing today. Uh, but additional criteria uh, are things like visual images and words that allow the children's Im imagination to expand. In other words, the poem should create some kind of vision or affect imagery in some way. You ought to be able to smell it or taste it or touch it or hear it. Uh, that's why uh, Sarah Cynthia Sylvia Stout works so well because it's brown bananas, right. mm -hmm. cottage cheese, yeah. and, and after as you're reading it, I don't know about anybody else, but as I'm reading it, my mouth is starting to oh, go, Oh yeah, Ew. it's such a sensory poem. Yeah, and you can almost, rubbery, blubbery macaroni, yeah. um, the green bologna and the rubbery, blubbery macaroni. These are things that kids can really kind of grab hold of and see an image for. And we're gonna give you some examples of these in just a couple minutes. Um, another thing is, is poems shouldn't be brought down to a child's supposed level. So it doesn't need to be childish and silly for the sake of it being that you think a kid would understand it. If it's silly for the sake of being funny, you know, that's different. But you don't need to talk down to children just like you wouldn't in a book. That's right. And most of the, the criminal books, and when I say criminal, I mean the books that should be a crime, uh, having been published, uh, come from, in many cases, famous people who say there are no good books for kids, so I'm going to write them. How hard can that be? And the answer is really mm -hmm. hard. And it's really difficult to write good poetry for kids. And uh, I want to leave that up to the professionals, yeah. <laughs> quite frankly. Um, a good uh, poem for kids should allow kids to interact with the poem. So I absolutely love uh, poems that allow kids to kind of get involved, mm -hmm. where they can make some of the noises, they can kind of chime in if there are repeated stanzas. Uh, we can do it as Reader's Theater. Mummy Slept Late and Daddy Fixed Breakfast is a great uh, Reader's Theater poem because you can have different parts and, and kind of go with that. So I like that idea that kids interact with the poem. And that interactive part of a poem definitely is a great thing whenever that one of the next criteria would say is it's good enough for repeated readings. With the repeated readings, it doesn't matter that you share this poem a couple times a week or once a week be, and then they get to really know their part in their interactive part they that just adds to the enjoyment just think about it if you only do the poem once and have their in, have them interact once they don't know their part the enjoyment isn't going to be there the enjoyment comes from the familiarity of what they're supposed to do so repeated readings is important. Absolutely important. Karen and I each brought just a couple books that you won't see in the next section mm -hmm. uh, in terms of books of poetry. And this is one and one, one, one of my favorites. Um, it was also a, a young adult or children's choice many, many years ago. You can tell how old this is. It was a 99 cent book at the Trumpet Club back when I was doing book quarters with kids. And so I bought 30 copies 
because that's pretty much the way this book would disappear. Uh, and this is Callie Dacos. This is one of her books. She has others. But this is called, If You're Not Here, Please Raise Your Hand, Poems About School. And uh, the poems range in length. Most of them are fairly short, and almost all of them are narrative. Uh, I love this one. This is a very brief one. It's called Teacher, Could You? Teacher, could you do what you ask us to do? Could you sit beside a friend and not talk to? Uh, sometimes just a little pointed. Uh, there's one in here called They Don't Do Math in Texas, which of course those of us who are in Texas absolutely love. And one of the final ones in this book is I Have No Time to Visit with King Arthur because I'm underlying now, underlining nouns and circling verbs and doing all those other things instead of going off on a quest and reading. Um, she absolutely gets what kids think about and so it should be no surprise that she was a classroom teacher mm -hmm. uh, and was writing poetry based on the kinds of things that she saw in her classes. This is K-A-L-L-I, Callie, Dacos, D-A-K-O-S. You might want to look for some of her books. She's older um, in terms of the books, but the kids will still absolutely love it. Um, you know, they like humor, and so limericks um, are a favorite. And so this is a Grimericks by Susan Pearson and illustrated by Grizz Grimley. And I love Grizz Grimley's mm -hmm. work. Uh, so here is one I'm going to share with you. Beware that you don't get too chummy with Martin MacGyver the mummy. He has termites and moths inside of his cloths and he'd rather have you in his tummy. <laughs> so, you know, limericks are always very funny to me. Concrete poems. Oh. Um, I absolutely love, there are two books, I think, by John Granditz. This is the first, it's called Technically It's Not My Fault. The first poem is here on the cover. And it says, I know, I know, you're really mad, but I can explain. See, I was reading about Galileo, a guy who made all these great discoveries and did cool experiments, and the book said that he dropped a heavy object and a light object out of a window to show that they'd land at the same time because gravity is constant. But I thought, no way. Heavy things fall fast and light things fall slow. We know this from Saturday morning cartoons, right? So I decided to do the experiment myself. I found a concrete block in the garage and I got a tomato from the fridge and I took them up to the attic and opened the window and rested them on the sill. And it really, really looked like there was going to be plenty of room for them to fall between the house and the car. I mean, like, who knew? So then I pushed them out the window together, but I must have pushed just the tiniest bit too hard because the block went out a little further than I expected and it kind of landed on the car. But you know what? The tomato got there at exactly the same time, which proves that Galileo was right. Boy, did I ever learn a lesson, and that's the important thing, isn't it? Um, I mean, even if you know something for a fact, like heavy stuff falls faster than light stuff, it's best to check it out with a carefully planned scientific experiment. Oh yeah, and I also learned not to drop concrete blocks out of the attic window. But in my opinion, the experiment was totally worth it, totally worth doing. There was just a slight mix-up, one tiny de detail that went wrong. So even though the car has a concrete block sticking out of it, technically it's not my fault. Uh, his second book was called Blue Lipstick and I love that one just as much. But there are a couple books that are kind of unusual. Um, another series that I love uh, is by, um, <clears throat> sorry, Ruth Heller, uh, Mini Luscious Lollipops. I'm going to share that one with you. It's all about um, Language. These are poems that in the illustrations inside are beautiful. Possessives always tell you whose. Our circus acts are front page news. The clown's red nose, the elephant's pose, the bareback rider's twinkling toes, her horse, and of course its prancing gait, and the daring young man with his trapeze mate. So there's many luscious lollipops talk about um, adjectives. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, wow, and unreal interjections and conjunctions. A cache of jewels, those are um, collective nouns. Mm -hmm. Up, up, and away, adverbs. Kites sail high, verbs. Merry-go-round, a book about nouns. Mine, all mine, a book of pronouns. Now, I don't know if that's all of them, but they're the all only ones I have on my shelf right now. But they're all beautiful inside, but they also have in, um, enjoyable poems that discuss. And they're, they're perfect for those teachable moment, yep. moments where you want to say, okay, so how do we identify an adjective? Let's go through and let's read this poem, and I'll bet you'll be able to kind of pick them up yourself. 
So yeah. I think it's good. A um, couple uh, final things that we'll mention here, and we're, we're going to go into much more detail next week, but you might kind of want to go scope these out. There are um, some major awards for poetry, and there are going to be more, thanks to Lee Bennett Hopkins, who's been making sure that poetry isn't the most overlooked of books. And uh, I think an excellent place to start is with the NCTE Award for Excellence in Poetry for Children. It began in the 70s, and it, at the time it was given every three years to a poet for his or her body of work. So when you look at the folks who have won it, and we will be doing that next week, you're looking at poets who published lots of poetry books for kids. And uh, you can go and you can uh, just, actually you can Google it, but you can go to the NCTE website and search for it there. It goes all the way back to the beginning. Then because poetry began to grow, the award moved from every three years to every year and now we're giving that out every year. So if you wanna look at kind of the history, you go back and you can see the early winners were David McCord and John Chiardi, a couple of people we've already talked about, all the way up to uh, the 2015 winner, which I think is the last one announced, and that was Marilyn Singer. Mm -hmm. And we love those Reverso poems. Right. And we'll take a look at them next week. I mentioned Lee Bennett Hopkins' name. He is a winner of the NCTE Award for Excellence in Poetry for Children, but he is also um, funded some awards that recognize poetry and poets and so we'll talk a little bit more about his stuff next week but he's the one calling attention again to the fact that we need to not overlook poetry we right. need to make sure we emphasize it do you want to take us out with a poem since we began with a poem sure I'm going to share with you um, one from a collection of Judith Vior's sad underwear and since we had um, some daddy cooking earlier, I'm going to share with you about mom cooking. It's called, Our Mom's a Real Nice Mom, But She Can't Cook. <laughs> mom's mashed potatoes taste like dirty socks. Her instant oatmeal tastes like instant, instant box. And if she made a pound cake and dropped it on your foot, you'd think that it was half a ton of rocks. Mom's soup could substitute for Elmer's glue. It's hard to tell her steak from an old shoe. And when she brought her chicken to the potluck at the Y, three people said they'd rather have the flu. <laughs> Mom's boss said she deserves a lot of praise, but not for tuna drowned in mayonnaise. And if he ate her salads, which are soggy as a swamp, we're positive that he'd take back her raise. Mom's macaroni's mush, and though she tries, she wrecks all the roasts, incinerates french fries. And when they give out ribbons, for worst meatloaf in the world, we guarantee that she would win first prize. Mom looks up recipes in every book. She took some lessons once they never took. She's kind to kids and animals. She smiles more than she scolds. She reads us books at bedtime, plays go fish when we have colds. She's good at fixing leaks. She changes tires of our olds, but all her casseroles turn into gook. Our mom's a real nice mom, but she can't cook. I love that we're sharing from Judith, one of Judith Fior's collections, and we'll talk about her again in the next uh, part of our um, poetry presentation. Because most people think of her as Alexander in the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Mm -hmm. And she has written wonderful poetry collections like this one and like If I Were in Charge of the World. And she's also written poetry on each successive decade of her life on turning 40 and other atrocities uh, and then she wrote one when she turned 50 when she turned 60 now that she's turned 70 hard to believe that Alexander's mom is in her 70s mm. although it makes me feel good that I'm not the oldest person <laughs> living out there so here's just a little taste to get you started the next part of the poetry broadcast will go into more detail give you some great resources and also share with you lots more books right all right, well, we will see you then. Look for the book titles in the description. And remember, email us if you have any suggestions. Bye.